Good morning, everybody. Come on in and find a spot, and we're, uh, we're going to praise our amazing God this morning. Please stand. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray, until I were made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope, like wildfire in our very soul. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. We are your church. We need your power. Your kingdom first, we hunger and we thirst, we refuse to waste our lives for your our joy and prize. To see the captives hearts released, the hurt, the sin, the poor. Put me 
gospel changes everything. Jesus enters the scene. 
changes everything. Amen. Forgot how this song started. All right, just give me a second. I just got to get it in my head. Wow, real professional of me. That, that's the problem with uh, when you do like multiple versions of the same hymn. It's just like one gets in your head and then you're like, oh man, it's hard to do a different one. So. fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who sent the Holy Spirit to fill his church, to minister and serve through the body to one another, to build the whole body up so that we can bring glory to God, but also to fill the church so that we can bring the gospel of light for the glory of God to a hurting, dying, dead world. That is our call this morning. We serve a king who cares about us, who cares about uh, the people that still haven't come. It's not our job to determine who is the right candidate. <laughs> Thank God for that. It's his job. So God, we just 
this morning. We just want to offer our lives once again to the King. You are the one who can call us. You are the one who can put us to work. And you do. So we just want to offer our lives once again to you for your glory. Jesus, you shed your precious blood so that we could be redeemed. You did that out of love for your Father. And Father, you said, you love the world and you gave your Son. So uh, what an amazing message that is. And this morning, Lord, we just want to celebrate that message. You've come. The light of the world has come. Jesus, the King. Amen. In the darkness we were waiting without hope without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin king the world from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt to the other side knowing this was our salvation Jesus for our sake you died praise the Oh 
Let's pray. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved. For in this hope we are saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the heart knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those who he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those who he justified, he also glorified. Lord, our hope is you. You are our only Savior. You have given us the Spirit. You have given us your presence, your very self. You have poured your love into our hearts. Lord, there is nothing in this life that compares to the goodness of knowing you. All other things distract us in a way you are the only one worth worshiping. You are the only king. You are the only one who saves. Lord, in the middle of difficulty, in the middle of suffering, we need you especially. When things don't make sense in life, we just recognize that we, we are entirely dependent on you. And so, Lord, we cry out. We raise up our worship, we raise up our prayers, our needs, our brokenness to you because we know you are the healer, you are the redeemer, you love to fix broken things. All of creation is looking forward to that day when we will be restored, when we will together reign with you forever in your kingdom on a new heaven, on a new earth. That is our hope. Our hope isn't in anything else. It's not in political parties. It's not in our self-identities. It's in you being our identity and you being our king and we being in your kingdom with you, in your presence forever. Lord, remind us of our need for you, of our hope in you, our eternal hope for you when things seem dark and when they seem bleak. We ask that you would remind us that we are part of a bigger family than even just here at Harvest. And so we ask that you would, you would be with us, your church, and that you'd be with the other churches in the St. Cloud area. We pray for Jubilee Worship Center. We pray for Pastor Mark. We also pray for Pastor Buddy. We pray that they would serve this community, that your word would work powerfully through them into the lives of the people you have given them to care for. Help them manage the many challenges that they face. Help them be comforted by your presence. Lord, we also pray for the Harvest Women's Ministry. Lord, we just ask that you would use the book study that they're going through, the book called What Love Is. 
Lord, that study, we pray that it would just move powerfully in the hearts of the women involved in it, that you would bring the right people to that group, that deep fellowship and care for one another would develop, and that the truth of what your love is would shine forth through that study. And Lord, we also pray for our missionary of the month, the Pregnancy Resource Center. Lord, right now feels a little desperate, in a sense, seeing how our, our particular state is actively attacking the unborn. Lord, we cry out to you in desperation. We do not like to see innocent lives lost. So we just ask for your intercession. We recognize our dependence and need for you to change the hearts of people. Because that's where it needs to start, Lord. We want the gospel to be the means by which our culture is transformed so that the idea of abortion just seems abominable. Help us serve those that have done these, done this before too, Lord, that we would love mothers and families and bring healing and hope in the midst of their circumstances, whatever they might be. Thank you for so many being moved to serve at Harvest in various ministries for women in need and for children. Lord, we, we just bring forward so many petitions uh, to you for people that are in need. We pray for Patty Blonsky. We pray for Brittany Fletcher and Susie Gordon and Rachel. Lord, we ask that you would heal, that you would move and, and just fix our broken bodies, especially of these, of these women. And for others here that have needs as well, Lord, may our bodies be f just be functioning and full in the, so that we can use them to serve you. Lord, we want all of our lives to be a service to you, an act of worship to you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for Pastor Larry. I pray that the word he brings to us this morning would, would move from not only into our minds but into our hearts, that our lives would be transformed by it, that our actions would be changed by it. Thank you for your word and the promise that it does work powerfully and seeing it move powerfully here, Lord. We ask that you'd bless, bless him today. And we just lift all our prayers to you, knowing that you are a loving father and you love and know just what to do with him. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Jonathan Fleck. I'm the youth and family pastor here at Harvest. It's great to see you all. It's fun seeing some new faces in the crowd. I just want to give you a little update. We don't have a slide for it. You can leave it right there. Uh, every morning from 9 to 9.45, right here in the basement of Harvest Fellowship, we have a Sunday school crafted by some of the coolest educators in our church just for our kids here. And so if you're a family and you've got little ones, anywhere from zero all the way up till fifth or sixth grade, we have a place for them downstairs. We have three different classes going on, and it is just a blessing to see uh, these little kids loving one another, learning to love God, and having these awesome volunteers serving down there. And so if, if you're interested in participating as a family in our Sunday school, we meet every morning, every Sunday, 9 to 945. And during that time, parents... Uh, you can hang out with my awesome wife, actually in room 203 across the way, drink some coffee, and talk about raising kids together. Right now they're doing a study together on technology. How do we engage technology well as families? And so if any of that's of interest to you, we'd love to serve you through that ministry every morning here at Harvest. Moving on to some other announcements. Molly is planning to de-decorate the church Thank you so much, Molly, for setting our church up so well for Christmas this year. It's beautiful. I don't know if you're here this morning or not. But she will need lots of helpers. And so it would be really great if you could stick around and... Oh, that's today. It's today. So immediately after the service, Molly is here somewhere. I don't see her. There she is. We would be so blessed. Many hands makes the load much lighter and faster. So if you can stick around afterwards, just help pick up decorations. That would be a super awesome blessing to everyone. 
We're also participating in the PRC's Baby Bottle uh, fundraising campaign this year. It's a little different. It's a virtual campaign. Uh, and so if you go to the Harvest News, that weekly uh, email that we give you, and click on the Give Now button, there's also a... Uh, URL code, that little scan thing, you can take a picture of it with your phone, it'll take you right where you need to go. And if you can give that way and support that ministry, that would be awesome. We really value the work of the PRC. Um, you can look at the Shine His Light promotion on the Harvest News, that specific title is what you're looking for there. And then tomorrow night at 7 p.m. at Calvary Community Church, a recording artists and husband and wife duo, Nick Gonzalez and Jackie I'll pr I'm going to... Velasquez. Thank you. You're so helpful. I appreciate it. They'll be leading an evening of worship. And uh, this event is an opportunity to gather with the body of Christ regionally here in central Minnesota uh, to turn our hearts in, into unity with one another and toward God as we prepare for the Celebrate Minnesota Evangelistic Outreach event that's coming up. And that festival, that evangelism festival will be in August. I believe it will be 11th and 12th. And so this is an opportunity just to kind of build some momentum for that event. I'm participating with some of the other youth leaders in central Minnesota. Dan's participating with some of the other pastors, and, and so is Larry. We might have other people. There's quite a few people here right from our congregation that are directly involved with the organization of that event and helping kind of direct the direction it goes. So if you want to participate with this evening of worship and get involved, that'd be awesome. It's going to be a great evening. Another reminder is that our annual celebration service and annual meeting is next Sunday. And so copies of the 2023 proposed budget are available at both entrances if you're interested in, in taking a look at that or previewing it before our meeting. If you have any questions or concerns about either the budget or the new deacons we will be voting on, those new deacons will be Bill Eikhoff, Molly Oliver, Tracy Rodriguez, and Elizabeth Sikayewicz. Uh, please just talk to one of us elders and... Uh, just let us know be sometime between now and next week if you have any thoughts. And then lastly, the morning will conclude, that's next Sunday, after the service, the morning will conclude with a tacos in a bag potluck lunch that we'll be enjoying together in the gymnasium. It's going to be so delicious. I love potlucks. Who else loves potlucks here? I just love it. Getting together and eating food. The church has been doing that since the beginning. Let's just keep it rolling, you know? Anyway, listen carefully for some instructions for what you should bring for the potluck. You can see it there up on the slide. A through L, that's a great idea. Take a picture with your phone. A through L, bring a salad to share. M through Z, and that's your last name, bring a dessert to share. He, Harvest in Espanol, they're bringing stuff too. They're bringing right, refried beans, guacamole, jalapenos, and salsa to share. For the rest of our announcements, just check out the video that follows me. Or if you have any questions, you can reach out to Pastor Dan or contact our office at 320-529-8838. We greatly value being able to worship the Lord through giving, and we appreciate how He consistently provides through faithful people. You can deposit your tithe or offering in a box located at either entrance, or you can give online at harvestmn.com, through Harvest News, or by downloading the Vanco mobile app on your phone. Now let's take time for some fellowship. We want everyone to feel at home here, so reach out and welcome those around you. Go help yourself to a cup of hot coffee out in the foyer, and the music will call us back when it's time for the sermon.
Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to Harvest Fellowship. It is good to see you all. I hope you're having a great weekend. Um, I've been having a great weekend, but you know what? I'm thinking about quitting football. <laughs> Until later today. But, but you know, <laughs> anyway. Um, in fact, last Sunday, I don't know if you remember that. It was a distant week ago. Yeah, last Sunday, we had such a fabulous Sunday morning service. I actually wasn't that sad when the Vikings lost. So it's, I, I thought that was it. So thank you. Y'all helped me ahead of time. That was good. That was good. I want to remind you that this is Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. So, and as uh, John brought out, please pray. There is a big, big decision going on this. I think it's tomorrow. So uh, just unbelievable that uh, we need to care about the people who have no say, the people who can't speak for themselves, the little babies. Yeah. Well, at any rate, um, I want to invite the Mexico group to come on up. We're going to pray over you. We're sending out a team to Ensenada, and they will be down there uh, helping Jim and Karen, uh, who we've sent down ahead of time. Uh, they're serving now at the YWAM there in uh, Ensenada, and they're going to be going down to build a house for a family that can't afford a house. And so we want to uh, pray for them. Elders, please come up. You're going to help us pray. You can come on up here. There we go. At least we've got a couple more maybe there. Okay. Okay, there's a. There we go. Come on. There we go. Okay. Don't you love seeing our church really likes missions, don't they? <laughs> it's good good to see. You know, the team is going to be gone next Sunday for our celebration service. So it's, you know, this is a, a lot of people that are going to be gone, but that's okay. We're going to, you're with us. You're going to watch it on video, right? I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Okay. All right. Let's go ahead and pray. Here, Dan, I'm going to, you're the uh, token person for everybody else here. There we go. Father, I, I thank you for this group right here. These are people who love Jesus and who want to serve you, and especially, just as you've said, they want to serve the people who need help, the truly poor, and that's what they're going down to do right now. So I ask that you would bless them, that you would each person fill them with your Holy Spirit, that they would have opportunities throughout the time there to even share their faith, to encourage one another and those who live there and to accomplish this incredible task that's going to make a, a world of difference in a family. So bless them. Uh, keep them all safe and protected in Jesus' name. Bless them, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And thank you all. Appreciate it. So, the baby's going too? <laughs> okay, let's pray again. Father, we praise you. You're worthy. It's all about you, your kingdom, your son. And we ask that you would help us to get our focus off of ourselves and on to you. Teach us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 5 through 17. That's page 648 in the Bibles that we give away. So if you don't have a Bible, just raise your hand. Someone will bring you one. It's our gift to you. We're going through 1 Corinthians verse by verse. And specifically, this book uh, brings out a major emphasis of how every 
person who's a true believer has a part to play in advancing the kingdom of God. Uh, and as I, I like to say, uh, we everybody gets to play, okay? So we have a part to play. And in, in this particular message is going to bring that out once again. Before we look at it, though, I thought we would watch a video. If you uh, didn't quite understand that, none of those things seemed really realistic, did they? None of those things seemed realistic, did they? You see, evolution has no plan, no direction, just meaningless randomness that inevitably results in nothingness. Common sense and innate uh, within us understanding tells us we were made for a purpose. But what purpose? Why were we made? Our passage helps us with this question. Who am I? A servant of God. Who are we? God's temple. In this passage, we see how we individually and corporately fit into God's plan. So let's go ahead and read 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 5 through 17. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? They are servants through whom you believed, and each has a role the Lord has given. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So then, neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's co-workers. You are God's field, God's building. According to God's grace that was given to me, I have laid a foundation as a skilled master builder, and another builds on it, but each one is to be careful how he builds on it. For no one can lay any foundation other than what has been laid down. That foundation is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become obvious for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire. The fire will test the quality of each one's work. If anyone's work that he has built survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will experience loss. But he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Don't you yourselves know that you are God's temple and that the Spirit of God lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple... God will destroy him, for God's temple is holy, and that is what you are. So let's see how this passage fits into the overall theme that we've been looking at in this book, that uh, everyone gets to play, that we all have a part to play, specifically answering the questions, who am I and who are we? I don't know if you noticed, but it begins, who am I, and it ends, who are we? So... Let's take a look at this in a little more detail. In verses, not sure. In verses five through nine, it just goes dark. 
Let me try going back. Okay, there's that. I don't know. Well, while they're working on it, verses 5 through 9, that's that first section of this passage, we see that we each have a part to play, okay? Anybody ever been to Disney World or Disneyland? Okay, they, they, they have a comprehensive strategy of how they do things. I mean, if you've ever been there, especially if you've looked behind the scenes, everything has a detailed plan behind it. And it's, uh, it's amazing how it all works together, okay? And the reason why I bring that up, I want you to imagine you go to Disney World and let's say, you know the characters that dress up like uh, Mickey Mouse and those guys, okay? Let's just say they decide not to dress up, okay? So they're just hanging out without their their Mickey Mouse costumes on. Okay, then I also want you to imagine the cleaners. Can you imagine thousands and thousands of people, you know, in that park? There's actually lots of cleaners Let's, that are constantly picking things up because you know it is immaculate, that place is, right? Okay, so let's imagine all the cleaners decide to just sit around and drink coffee instead. Okay. Then I want you to imagine the tellers, you know, and they're everywhere that are taking people's money. Okay. Let's just say they decide. Go ahead. Everybody gets to go free. Okay. And uh, the maintenance for the rides. Okay. That's just kind of ignored. Okay. Uh, some people will get fired, don't you think? Okay. All right. Now, God isn't going to fire you. <laughs> you were wondering, oh, you're talking about us. <laughs> God, God isn't going to fire you, but the church is not just an amusement park that we could get along with or without. It is God's plan to reach the world, and you are an integral part of that plan. Every single person in this place. Okay? We see... In verse 5, who we are. Who am I? I am a servant. He begins with verse 5. He says, what then is Apollos? What is Paul? They are servants through whom you believed. And each one has the role the Lord has given. If you remember, he's been bringing up this subject since chapter 1 about Paul and Apollos because the church at Corinth was divided. Some were saying, well, I following Apollos and others were saying well I'm following Paul and he says what are you guys talking about we're just servants just like you as believers that's who we are we are servants now in a democratic world we don't get the idea of servanthood very well okay uh, so I'm going to ask you a question what is the difference between a servant and and the master. Okay. Yes. All right. Who's the boss? You see, Jesus is Lord, and we are not. That's what we want to get here. We are servants. He's the Lord. We don't get to call the shots. Now, Jesus is genuinely interested in our ideas, but he overrides our decisions and makes the ultimate plan. So we follow him. We get in on his plan. We serve him. That's what Paul is saying about him and Apollos, okay? Uh, you ever watch The Chosen? Okay. Now, I'll tell you what, that is an absolutely fantastic series. If you have not seen it yet, watch it, okay? Third season's on. I think they got, what, six episodes now done? And every single episode, you just see, it's almost like you're reliving Jesus as he's picking the, apolo the apostles, you know? And it's really, I mean, just, I, I can't think of an episode I haven't cried at. It's just like, because I'm so moved, because it reminds you of what Jesus came to do, okay? So, but he, 
chose these apostles. And so, you know, you would think, okay, the apostles, wow, they're the big cheese, right? The apostles, have you seen the chosen? They're they're like stumbling, bumbling, aren't they? Just like the gospels portray them, okay? And that's what Paul... That's what Paul is saying here. We're just ordinary people just like you. We're servants, lowly servants. And he says they were there. uh, They were used to bring the Corinthians to Jesus and to disciple them. That's what he means here in verse 5. They are servants. Who's, Who's Paul? Who's Paul? They are servants through whom you believed. And each has a role the Lord has given him. So they each have a role, just like all of us. We all have a role that God gives us. So now I want you all to close your eyes, okay? I just want you to take a minute. I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to contemplate in silence, what does it mean for me to be a servant in Jesus to be the Lord. hope that many of you heard his voice. When we stop to just be quiet for a moment and invite the Lord to speak, sometimes he does. And I hope you heard. And uh, cause could you imagine if we all heard this truly in our hearts and began to live it out? According to this passage, we are servants. Who am I? I am a servant. Verses 6 and 7, we then go on to see that we all have a job to do as servants. He says, I planted, this is Paul talking, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So then, neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who gives growth. The growth. We all have the job to do. Uh, Paul saying he particularly was a planter. He was an evangelist. He led people to Jesus on a regular basis and planted churches. He says Apollos was the waterer. He was more of the discipler. He was the one who helped raise them, helped them grow up. Because by the way, when you repent of your sins, place your faith in Jesus Christ and him alone as your savior, outwardly uh, confessing that faith in baptism, when you're born again, when you are a new believer, you're supposed to then start growing up. Remember we saw that last week? Okay, so... That takes discipleship. So some people evangelize, some people disciple, other people, we all have our parts, okay? So the question is, what is your part? Now I want to look at another passage of Scripture that gives three potential parts, okay? So we're going to be looking at this more even next week at some other parts that maybe is your part. So I want you to be thinking, though, what is my part? Okay, look at 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 9 through 11. Okay, 1 Peter 4. He says, Be hospitable to one another without complaining, Just as each one has received a gift, use it to serve others as good stewards of the varied grace of God. If anyone speaks, let it be as one who speaks God's words. If anyone serves, let it be from the strength God provides so that God may be glorified through Jesus Christ in everything. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. And notice what he says here. He's actually bringing out three potential gifts, and he calls them gifts. You receive a gift. As a good steward, you use the gift for God's glory and for the kingdom, right? So, but, and then he, he, the first gift he lists is hospitality. 
If that's your gift, hospitality, have people over your house. Does that make sense? Okay. So, so if that's your gift, use it. That's what he's saying. If, if anyone speaks, so maybe you are a speaker and uh, you have a good way of speaking. Maybe God has called you to teach or whatever. Well, get in front of some people. And speak, okay? As if you're speaking God's word. So make sure it is God's word that you're speaking, okay? So, so he speaks. But, but then he goes on, and that's for the, you know, some of the extroverts, I suppose. If anyone serves, let it be from the strength that God provides. So a lot of people, they're like, there's no way I could get up there up front and look as dumb as you do, Larry. Okay, so, you know, I can't, I can't do that. You don't have to. God isn't calling you to be somebody else. Maybe you're a little more introverted. Maybe you uh, like to just be behind the scenes. You don't want any credit, but you're a servant. Well, then serve. There's lots of stuff behind the scenes that needs to be done. Can you imagine that? Okay, so you serve. You volunteer. You say, I'd like to be a servant. You find out what you place. And you don't serve in your own strength, because if you serve in your own strength, you'll end up getting burned out. So make sure you're receiving from God. You're spending that daily quiet time reading his word, praying. You're involved in fellowship. You're coming to church. You're doing those kinds of things. So you're getting filled up, and then you serve. You do whatever God calls you to do to serve. And if we're all doing that, wow, incredible stuff happens. So, so here we see this, this great plan that fits all kinds of different people, relational people. They're the people that have people over, right? Okay, that's the hospitality people. The extroverts, they're the ones that like to talk, maybe sometimes too much. Okay, and then, so watch that. <laughs> There's a Bible verse in the book of James, and I think it only applies to extroverts. It does not apply to introverts. It says, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Okay? Uh, that's, uh, I say it only uh, applies to extroverts because introverts, they don't need to be told, uh, be, you know, be quick to listen, because typically they do listen very well, but they're, they're way too slow to speak sometimes. Okay, so you, know, you, you get my opinion. So, but if you're an introvert... To serve. Oh, but which, which part's more important? Right, they're all the same. That's the point that Paul's making in his passage. Him and Apollos, they're not against each other. They're not in competition. They're not trying to figure out who's better. Now, by the way, I will say this. Sometimes God does stretch us. Right? So sometimes... A person who doesn't have the gift of serving needs to serve, right? (laughs) And sometimes a person who's not very good at talking with people still needs to share their story, their faith, et cetera. You know, so sometimes God stretches us, but for the most part, he lets us be us, which is kind of cool, don't you think? Because he fashioned you in your mother's womb. Before you were even born, he was giving you your personality. And that's amazing. That's why those little babies are precious. Let's take care of them, okay? So, we all have a job to do, and we all get paid. Look at verses 8 and 9, okay? He says, now he who plants and he who waters are one. And each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's co-workers. You are God's field, God's building. We all get paid, okay? There's something about rewards that's actually true about this. Now, what exactly are the rewards? That we'll probably spend some more time on that later. Uh, but be, because, you know, you're trying to imagine, does that mean I get more hats or, or you know, bigger mansion or anything like that? Which reminds me of a joke, but I won't tell it. Okay, so we, we all get paid, though. There is such a thing as rewards. And I, I want you to notice here, though, that we're working together. It says that they're co-workers, for we are God's co-workers. We're working together, not against each other, towards one purpose. When he says that... Um, 
Let's see here. Uh, now he who plants and he who waters are one. When he says they are one, that can be understood in a couple different senses. It could refer to equal status, which is true. But it probably refers to being united in purpose. And in fact, that's how the NIV translates it. Have one purpose. Me and Dan and Aaron and John, we're the paid pastors here at Harvest. We complement each other uh, in amazing ways in our different giftings, our different personalities, our different callings even. I have never experienced such unity in purpose in any other church I have pastored or attended. I love these guys. And that's true with the elders too. Um, their giftings, their help in all of this, their heart. Oh, if you could just be there at our meetings. We all got together Thursday night. If you could just be there, even with the deacons, our deacons meeting was just like, we didn't want to go. Okay, it was just, there was such unity of purpose. If you, uh, I want to tell you, because that, the sky is the limit. As we all find our part to play, what does God have in store for Harvest Fellowship? Wow. Uh, more on that next week at our celebration service. See, we're going to look at, okay, where, what happened last week, last year, and where are we heading this year? So, you know, more on that next week. Now, so, so far we've seen we each have a part to play. We're all servants. We all have a job to do. We all get paid, okay? <laughs> um, with the rewards later. No checks coming. Okay. Okay. Uh, but the second part we see in this passage is that the church is the plan. See, God has a plan. And it's to accomplish, to advance the kingdom, to accomplish his purpose through the church. Okay. And before we look at the passage verse by verse, I want you to be remind you of something we saw in chapter 1. Most of the time in the New Testament when he refers to the church, he's not talking about the universal church, though sometimes he does. And so there is such a concept of all true believers throughout all time and throughout the world. There is that truth. But when he's talking here, he's talking about the local church at Corinth that particular church that he planted. So God has a plan for each local church. He has a plan for Harvest Fellowship. A part of Satan's master plan is to get us away from God's master plan. As believers, he's already lost us. If you've truly repented of your sins and placed your faith in Jesus Christ and him alone for your salvation, and you've outwardly expressed that in baptism, Satan's lost as far as your eternal soul is concerned. But he still wants to make you ineffective. And he does that quite often by getting many people to believe that just so long as they're a part of the universal church, they can avoid the local church. And lots of people don't have a local church. And they're true believers. And Satan is actually one in their life. And that's tragic. Um... 1 Corinthians, this book exposes this fallacy. We, God's plan is through the local church. Now, let's look at this, how it works. Okay, First of all, he starts out in verses 10 and 11 that Jesus is the foundation. If you want to know if the local church is actually a church, because by the way, just because the church calls itself a church doesn't make it a church. Right? 
Okay, so you have to have the right God and you have to have the right gospel. If you want to just bottom line, boil it down to essentials there. uh, And that's what we see here. Look at what he says, that Jesus is the foundation. Verses 10 and 11. According to God's grace that was given to me, I have laid a foundation as a skilled master builder. For those of you who are in construction, you can relate to this very well. You build it on a foundation. If the foundation is not solid, the rest of the building is not going to be solid, is it? Okay. So build it's build on a foundation as the ma- uh, as a skilled master builder, and another builds on it. You have a bunch of people putting it up together, don't you? But each one is to be careful how he builds on it. For no one can lay any foundation other than what has been laid down. That foundation is Jesus Christ. If it's not Jesus, the true Jesus, the Jesus who is both God and man, the Jesus who came and died on the cross to pay the penalty we were supposed to pay for our sins, and the third day rose again, that Jesus Okay, that's the foundation. But, it, but he, in another passage in Ephesians, I want you to turn to Ephesians 2, verses 19 through 22. He also elaborates on this foundation. Okay, so in Ephesians chapter 2, we'll start in verse 19 so we can get the context. He says, so then you are no longer foreigners and strangers. He's talking to Gentiles who get saved. Remember, uh, Paul was Jewish, and the original people of God were Jewish. Okay, So now then God opens up this mystery how he's allowing Gentiles to come in. And he says, before you got saved, you you were foreigners and strangers. So then you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone in him the whole building being put together grows into a holy temple in the Lord we'll get to that at the end of our passage that temple in him you are also being built together for God's dwelling in the spirit and so the foundation is Jesus actually in this passage he's the cornerstone and the foundation is the apostles and prophets. That's the writings of the apostles and prophets that we have right here in the Bible. The Bible is a major part of that foundation because it's God's word. So a church has to build itself on God's word, specifically, especially with Jesus Christ as the cornerstone. Does that make sense? If a church goes away from God's word, the building isn't going to be any good. That's the point we want to see here if you're still in that building analogy. So Jesus is the foundation and our labor is judged. Go back to our passage in 1 Corinthians 3 verses 12 through 15. If anyone builds on the foundation, that's our labor, our doing our part, whatever that part might be, uh, with gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become obvious for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire. The fire will test the quality of each one's work. If anyone's work that he has built survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will experience loss. But he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Now, we need to understand this passage a little more because he's saying here, okay, foundation, Jesus, and the apostles' writings, okay, so the word of God, there's your foundation. Now, we're supposed to build on it by doing our part. Now, we can do our part or we can just not do our part, then the building doesn't get built, right? Or we can do our part, but we don't do it in the strength of the Lord. Maybe, or we don't do it with the right motivation. Maybe you're only doing it to be seen by others or whatever, okay? That determines whether your building part is gold, silver, costly stones. Those are all good things, right? Or wood, hay, or straw. Now, the wood, hay, and straw in this illustration are bad things, because it's going to be tested by fire. Wood, hay, and straw burn up, right? Okay, so that's the point. You want 
gold. And by the way, we all, no matter what your part, it could be servant, it could be teacher, it could be, you know, whatever the parts they are, you could, it, your service, your work can either be gold, silver, costly stones, right motivation, doing it in the strength of the Lord, or wood, hay, stubble, not from God, doing it in your own strength, doing it for your own glory, etc. That gets burned. Now notice here, he says it will be tested by fire. Now I need to take a side step here. This passage has actually sometimes been used uh, to advocate a false doctrine called purgatory. Okay, have you heard of that? Purgatory? Supposedly a place that you go and continue to suffer a little more because you didn't pay enough reward or you know enough merit for your for your sins etc okay not in the bible anywhere definitely not here and we know that by the passage itself because it says that the fire tests the quality of each one's work it the fire doesn't burn the person it tests the works of the person. So this isn't talking about a future fire. It is talking about your works being tested. Are they from God or not? That determines your reward. Notice here, they are saved. So it's not, you know, you don't lose your salvation or anything like that. But with this, so it is tested. So the nature of this fire is evaluative, not punitive. But our labor is going to be judged, and it's going to be judged on Judgment Day, and there's going to be a reward for that. Do you want to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant? Okay. So here we see our labor is judged, and then lastly, don't wreck the temple. That's what's being built is the temple. Look at verses 16 and 17 now. He says... Don't you yourselves know that you are God's temple and that the Spirit of God lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is holy, and that is what you are. You, plural. Now, what's fascinating about this is Paul uses this analogy that we are a temple twice in the book of 1 Corinthians, okay? And in this place, he's actually using it in a plural sense. These are all plural, not you singular, you plural. That is one of the um, one of the reasons why, especially theologically, many times Greek is better than English. In old English, we had a, a you plural and a you singular, didn't we? Well, in the South we do, yeah, y'all. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> but, but okay, but we don't have that. So when you hear you in this passage, you, you're thinking you personally, but it's in the plural in the Greek, and it's saying y'all. Okay, so God was a southerner, apparently. Okay, so, so, but it is plural, whereas in chapter 6, go ahead and skip there. Chapter 6, verse 19, we see the same similar illustration, different context. Verse 19, he says, Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought at a price, so glorify God with your body. This is singular. You, your body, and he's specifically referring, if you look back at verse 18, flee sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the person who is sexually immoral sins against his own body. You're actually hurting yourself is what he's saying. So don't do that because you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. So if you're a true believer, the Holy Spirit lives in you personally, singular, that's this passage in chapter 6. But he also lives in us, plural. That's the chapter 3 passage. The temple is us. So in one sense, the temple is me. But in this sense, in chapter 3, the temple is us, especially when we're gathered together. When we're gathered together and the Holy Spirit is in our midst and we sense his presence powerfully, 
then we're literally changed. He begins to do his work in the individual parts of the temple. He makes you more like Jesus. He empowers you. He gives you revelation. He helps you understand what your part is. And as you're talking together, you start serving each other, working together, united. You're filled. Have you felt that before? Being filled with the Holy Spirit? Whew. I, I am truly amazed that the Bible says that that is just a taste of what's going to come. Okay? Just imagine when Jesus Christ returns. And the, uh, but even now, this is the point, okay? When we gather, can you see why Satan doesn't want us to gather? He did this whole COVID thing to stop this. He does not want us to gather together. Look at Hebrews chapter 10. I know it's not up there, sorry. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 through 25. Very, very important in our day. He starts out, Hebrews chapter 10. I'll give you a second there to turn since you don't have the page number. Hebrews 10, 23. He says, let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering since he who promised is faithful. So we hold on to that confession of our hope that we get from the Bible, the foundation. Let's hold on to it, the gospel. And let us consider one another in order to provoke love and good works. How can we provoke love and good works amongst each other? Now, he does have a plan for us to reach the world, but this primarily is looking at how can we bless each other. And then he goes on to say this, not neglecting to gather together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other and all the more as you see the day approaching. And I know that there are some who, because of compromise, uh, immune system, et cetera, we can't gather together, but he wants us to gather. I know they would even tell you that they miss being able to gather together because this is so essential to the body of Christ. Gathering together. And by the way, the Greek word is episunagogoge. Hard to say. But did you hear did you hear a word in that? Episunagogoge? Synagogue, right? Because the early church was patterned after the synagogue where they weekly gathered together to pray and to study God's word and to worship God. So this is this is referring to not just gathering together, but to gathering together as the church, as a local church church here at Harvest Fellowship. We're gathering together right now. And the Holy Spirit then does such a great work in this. And he's saying in our passage here that don't destroy God's temple. This temple right here. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. It's that bad. He really cares about his church. And so we are holy as the church of God, set apart for his service, for God's temple is holy, and that is what you are. That's our identity. Remember, sometimes we don't live out our identity. (laughs) But that's who we are, truly, as believers. We are holy. We're set apart for God's service. He has a plan for us. So, do you want to be happy? It's okay to say yes (laughs) to that question, okay? Yes. But listen, to ultimately fulfill the desire to be happy... You must set aside that desire and surrender to God's call on you. If you seek your own happiness, you'll never get it. But if you die to self, you'll end up being extraordinarily happy. So be his servant. Follow him as Lord. Then you will be happier than you could possibly imagine. 
Doesn't mean bad things aren't going to happen. <laughs> bad things are going to happen. Let me just break it to you softly here. <laughs> okay? Bad things are going to happen. But with the Holy Spirit in you, as you have dedicated yourself to him, knowing the rewards are coming later, you can do it in his strength. I know personally some prodigals that have walked away from God. They wanted to be happy by being free from his restraints. And they're miserable. Every one of them. Do you want to be happy? Discover who you really are and who we are. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for every single person here, every single person online, every single person who's a part of Harvest Fellowship. I love this church. It is a beautiful temple, an absolutely beautiful temple. Thank you. Thank you, God, for calling me here. You are truly good to me, good to us. And so we praise you. But we confess that sometimes we, we put our happiness above you and your lordship. Forgive us. Thank you that you do forgive us because of the blood of Jesus. It's not because of our good works. It's not because of our trying harder. It's just simply because of your good work on the cross. You're amazing. We'll, we'll never be able to pay that back, and you don't even ask us to. <laughs> freely you have given but we do want to know each of us what's our part I pray for every single person help them to discover that help them to find it and be satisfied in it it could be very very simple but they find that part they do it in your strength great things happen through us as your temple we praise you Lord Build your church now. In Jesus' name, let's stand, continue to worship. Before the band starts here, I just wanted to say something. We're going to play just for a minute or so before this song. If the Lord has been uh, just working on your heart, maybe convicting um, that you've been holding back from uh, surrender, holding back from making yourself available to him in the body of Christ. I just want to give this uh, a little space for that. Uh, maybe you need to spend some time with him, talking to him about that and uh, before we start the song. So let's just uh, play this intro um, for about the next minute or so.
let's sing that again. Here is where I lay it down, every burden, every crown. This is my surrender. This is my surrender. Here is where I lay it down, every lie and every doubt. This is my surrender. And I will make room. For you to do whatever you want to, to do whatever you want to, I will make room for you to do whatever you want to, to do whatever you want to. tradition break down the walls of all my religion your way is better your way is better shake up the ground of all my tradition break down the walls of all my religion your way is better your way is better shake up the ground of all my tradition, break down the walls of all my religion, your way is better, your way is better, shake up the ground of all my tradition, break down the walls of all my religion, your way is better, your way is better, and I will be
Beautiful, beautiful. I want to remind you, we will have people up front here and, and people around with yellow badges that are there to pray for you. So if you need prayer, just please free, free. I've been seeing more and more people asking for prayer, and that is a good thing, okay? Because that means God is going to do more things. So take advantage of that. Next week, we have our celebration service. We have a few people getting baptized. You can still get in on that, but I have to meet with you, okay? So let me know. Call the office or come and talk to me personally, and uh, we're going to have a, it's a glorious way to start the new year. So uh, come and talk to me about that, okay? May God bless you, each of you, uh, with uh, the discovery of that part of me. You be happy and discovering that part that God has for you to do in the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Amen.